All the commentators were writing off the Labour Party uh, six to seven months ago, and I never did this. I always thought that they were in with a chance. I think it's very early to say at the moment. It obviously looks like a Conservative swing, but I think it's too early to pass uh, the final conclusion. What are you going to do uh, in the next Parliament if there's a Conservative government? Are you going to try and replace the <coughs> Labour Party as the radical alternative to Toryism again? I think this is far too early to say, but I have had some experience of being in opposition to the Tories from 59 to 64, so it will not be a new experience for me. Now, on the uh, board so far, there's a loss of nearly 4% in the Liberal vote. Uh, what do you attribute this to? Well, I think there has obviously been polarisation. Uh, there has obviously been uh, a move towards a Conservative government. Uh, I think it's too early to say whether this will be reflected equally in regions, uh, whether, for example, it will be the same in Scotland or in Wales or in parts of the West Country. I think it's very early to say. But I think there has been a swing to the right, and I think there's no, uh, no doubt about that at all. Mr Thorpe, thank you. I have to move away now and go to Sir Keith Joseph in Leeds. Good morning, Sir Keith. Hello. Uh, I can't uh, the Prime Minister and Mrs Wilson arrive in the hall at Highton to mixture of booze from Conservative and applause from Labour. They greet the Chairman of the Council. There's a, a pause for a moment because the returning officer is still checking on the table the uh, final count. Just the last check with the representatives of the three candidates. The Prime Minister has been in a small room at the side here, has only just appeared in the hall, was watching television with his wife right up to the moment that he came in. There are three other candidates here. Conservative, a communist, Joe Kenny, who was deeply involved in the 1966 Seaman strike that uh, caused such trouble immediately after the 66 election and a representative of Desmond Donnelly's Democratic Party. And uh, we go back, we go back now to uh, Sir Keith Joseph in Leeds, I think. Uh, Sir Keith, Sir Keith, I'm sorry about that, but uh, what with the rush of things, they went straight over to the Prime Minister. Um, Sir Keith, um, what do you think of things so far? They look hopeful, don't they? Well, uh, we predict a Conservative majority over Labour at 43 at the moment, but it's, the swing is not quite as large as it is. Um, may I put to you, uh, by the way, how well did you do yourself? I've forgotten the details. I'm afraid I did rather disappointingly. I didn't get the national swing. What did you get? I think uh, much about the same as last time. Yes, which was? 5,000. Yes, but what would you, do you remember what your swing was? I ought to know. Oh, very small. Yes. Very small indeed. Do you, do you know why that was? Mm, the constituencies changed a bit, but yes. I'm naturally disappointed. Yes. Uh, Sir Keith, um, Mr Short was on, the, on this programme earlier, and he said that if there's a, a Conservative government, uh, this is due largely to the devaluation scare raised, as he said, so irresponsibly by Mr Heath in the last few days of the campaign. What do you say to that? I think the devaluation comments of Mr Heath, that if uh, the socialists had gone on with the policies of the last few years, that sort of result would have been likely again, was perfectly valid. But I think that what the results so far have shown is that uh, Mr Heath and all my colleagues' predictions were right, that the Tory vote was very keen to come out, uh, and the Labour vote wasn't so keen. Sir it, Keith, do you think that Mr Enoch Powell has been in this campaign an asset or a liability to the Conservative Party? Well, it's a very difficult thing to judge, but uh, I should have thought on the whole, judging from the swing in his own area, uh, an asset, at least in his own area. Um, Sir Keith, do you... Um, uh, well, perhaps I shouldn't ask you this, but uh, 
Uh, what sort of post would you like in a Conservative government? Uh, trade and technology and industry? You're quite right. That's not a question you should ask, or, and certainly not one I should answer. These things are entirely up to Mr Heath. Right. Thank you, Sir Keith. Caught. 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 There's a little whiskey in there which takes us to Scotland and Glasgow for a comment from, from Glasgow from Hugh Cochran. Oh, he's not there. I ought, I ought to have another uh, sip of his Scots there. Uh, Brighton, Kemp, Brighton, Kemp Town, I see. Oh, you're talking, Hugh. The Gorbals and many of the others. Conservatives have held one. With you now. Uh, Hugh, uh, I'm sorry, we missed just the beginning of that because we're having trouble with the lines. There's so sorry, much news being this bashed in us at the moment that the whole thing's exploding on the screen. Can you begin again? I'm sorry. By all means. Uh, in Glasgow, we've had quite a batch of results so far with no change at all. Labour majority slashed in a great number of... This return is signed by me, Donald Wilgoose, as Deputy Acting Returning Officer for this constituency. Here are the figures. John Nicholas McAlpine Entwistle. Conservative. 24,509. <laughs> I'll give you that again because some of the press didn't get it. John Nicholas McAlpine Entwistle, 24,509. Joseph Ivor Kenny. John Walter Gerald Sparrow, 1,232. James Harold Wilson, 45,583. I don't think the press got that either. I'll repeat that again. James Harold Wilson, 45,583. I declare the said James Harold Wilson duly elected to serve as a member for the heightened constituency. Mr. Acting, Mr. Acting Returning Officer. <laughs> Mr. Acting Returning Officer, first may I congratulate you and all those who have worked with you on the organization of this election in the heightened constituency and on the speedy way in which you have produced a result in what is a large constituency. To my own supporters, may I thank them for the tremendous fight they have put up with this increased majority here in Heighton. May I also say to my opponents that I would like to thank them also for the way in which they have conducted this fight. To the Conservative candidate, the runner-up, and to the other two candidates, with somewhat lesser votes, may I say that uh, throughout this campaign in Heighton, the um, election has been fought in a clean and a fair way by all candidates and by all those who have supported them. I am naturally gratified at the result here in Heighton because I remember the days when I was defending 834 majority and I want to thank all those, not only the party workers, who have supported me, but also the very large number of heightened constituents who have recorded their confidence in me personally and in the Labour Party. I thank you. Well, I haven't actually got the percentages here. The system's got a little clogged up with the number of the... 
Well, the results so far in Wales show that the Plaid Cymru threat to the Labour Party is still very much of a reality. They polled well in Anglesey, they got nearly a third of the poll there, they halved the Labour majority in Aberdeer. On the other hand, in Ron the West, which is a constituency in which Plaid Cymru had polled remarkably well in a by-election in 1967, there Plaid Cymru fell away and the Labour majority remained very much intact. So far as there is a swing, therefore, in South Wales from the Labour Party so far, it's a swing not to the Conservatives, who, as a matter of fact, have lost three deposits out of the five Welsh results in Wales, but it's a swing towards the Welsh nationalists. And I think we in Wales will be looking forward with great interest to the result at Caerphilly shortly, which is, which is a constituency in industrial South Wales where Plaid Cymru and their candidate, Dr Phil Williams, would, I think, expect to do exceptionally well. The one result in North Wales so far in Anglesey, a rural seat, the Minister of Agriculture, Cledwin Hughes in trouble over the farm price review and other agricultural problems, suffering heavily to Plaid Cymru again. I think we, we ought to have comment on two things very quickly, really. The first one is about the S.O. Davis result, which we got, got a hint of before. Well, that is, the S.O. Davis one is really quite extraordinary because it's the first time since 1945 that a member has successfully defied the party machines and got in against them. It has been said that this could no longer be done. And if S.O. Davis can do it in Merthyr, can Desmond Donnelly do it in Pembroke? That's one of the questions we're left with. Uh, this is really rather fascinating. I think you, yes, Alan, you ought to have a word about S.O. Davis yes, before we go on about Meriden, which I'll ask you about next. Go on. So indeed, those two things are rather different because S.O. Davis was very highly thought of in this constituency, and I believe there was the feeling that, in a sense, the Labour Party had treated him badly, and this could be that kind of reaction, which presumably is. But quite extraordinary, and as you say, almost without precedent. We're keeping our eye uh, on perhaps a possible interview very soon with, with Mr Heath, who's down at Vexley. But, but let's now comment about Meriden, I Well, think. it's not just Meriden. Meriden and Wellingbur, the Conservatives, have held. These were both by-election gains, so they may be considered gains. On the other hand, the Labour Party has held on to Coventry South and Rugby, two West Midland seats that might have been expected to go, granted what's been happening in the West Midlands. It seems to me this West Midland phenomenon is just west of Birmingham, but east of Birmingham, here you've got these much lower swings. In, when Edward Boyle was talking earlier in, about Selly Oak and being pleased with it, actually it was only a 1% swing to the Conservatives there. However, in Stetchford, there's been a 7% swing against Roy Jenkins, much bigger than any other of the Birmingham swings that I have seen, except, I think, for Perry Barr, which the Conservatives have gained very much against the odds, just as they did, of course, back in 1964. And now let's have a comment, please, from Harold Webb. They're all rushing in, Harold, and we haven't got a word in eight ways from you. Go on. Well, Cliff, one of the interesting things that's emerged from the results tonight is that in some of these heavy industrial areas, this is where the Conservatives have been making their advance, and one is tempted to ask the question whether unemployment hasn't, in fact, been a big issue in this election. Uh, not unemployment on a dramatic scale, the sort of things that they get in the North East or on Merseyside or in Scotland where Labour hasn't been doing too badly. But if you look at the scoreboard, and especially in the north on both sides of the Pennines, some of these towns that have ingrained uh, industrial problems, the whole structure of industry is being changed, places like Bolton, Preston, Stockport, Keithley, Berry and Ratcliffe, these are the seats which have been tumbling to the Conservatives and of course they have been seesawing for these past 20 years because of these ingrained industrial problems and they are going to pose problems even for a Conservative government. Cliff? Uh, Thank, thank you very much indeed. Now let's have a quick word of Belper, where I believe that Mr. Brown is. Let's go up there to Belper. How's the count going there, please, in Belper? You joined us at a very tense moment in Belper. We are not too far away from the count now. Mr. George Brown has been the member here for the past 25 years, but this most certainly has been his toughest fight for re-election. To be unseated, he needs a swing against him of some 3.3%. And if the national average figure were to be repeated here, then he would be defeated. But after all, George Brown is George Brown, and his camp do seem to be putting a great deal of emphasis on that. I think that, that we really should leave it, because uh, any moment at all, what we're going to be able to do is to take you down to Bexley, where I believe even now uh, that Mr Heath is waiting there to talk uh, to uh, Michael Charlton. And now let's go down to Bexley to join Michael Charlton and Edward Heath. Mr Heath, do you accept that you're not only member for Bexley again with a quadruple majority, but also Prime Minister of the country tomorrow morning? Well, I'm delighted with the result here in Bexley. 
uh, as you say, my majority has increased a very great deal. And I'm particularly grateful to everybody who's worked here in Bexley while I've been conducting the campaign for the party over the whole country. Uh, 